gonna do a shower. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen her in a quieter room like Sarah did this morning. Have you noticed she quieted that room before she ever said a word? I've never seen that done. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have that present. So, you're in the science and faith room. So I hope you're in the right room. Um, I want to introduce to you Dr. Lawrence Principe. I first uh, heard his recordings years ago on um, this great courses. Uh, you know, see your lecture series you can buy on. They were actually on cassette back then. And was astounded when I listened to these things. I listened to them over and over driving the car. And then one day we decided, we're just going to call. I just said, I'm going to call. I just want to come here. And so he came about four years ago. I guess, and he spoke on this, what I think is probably the most challenging question with regard to modern day faith uh, in, in daily life. And that is the challenges that science has presented to the idea of God and faith. Um, and so we're, I, I feel like he is probably the leading the thought leader worldwide in this, in this field today with what he has to say. He's done uh, John Hopkins who read his uh, bio. Uh, he's well regarded as a chemist in addition as well regarded as understanding the history of science and religion. Uh, so to, to just un introduce kind of the challenge that we want to think about in this hour, uh, we're really talking about the success of faith. Uh, is uh, a, a quote I love from uh, Dostoevsky's last novel, written and uh, published a year before he died. This is 1880 now that, that he's writing. Uh, Remember, young man, unceasingly, Father Pacey began, without preface, that the science of this world, which has become a great power, has, especially in the last century, analyzed everything divine handed down to us in the holy books. After this cruel analysis, the learned of this world have nothing left of all that was sacred of old, but they have only analyzed the parts and have overlooked the whole. And indeed, their blindness is marvelous. Yet the whole still stands steadfast before their eyes, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Has it not lasted 19 centuries? Is it not still living? A moving power in the individual soul and in the masses of the people. It is still as strong and living, and even in the souls of atheists who have destroyed everything. For even those who have renounced Christianity and attack it in their inmost being still follow the Christian ideal. Hitherto neither their subtlety nor the ardor of their hearts has been able to create a higher ideal of man and of virtue than the ideal given by Christ of all. When it has been attempted, the result has only been grotesque. And, I, you, and some of you may know, I uh, built businesses in Russia, worked in Russia uh, for over 10 years. And it started that in 1989 when the, the uh, evidence of the wreckage of that grotesque convention was still evident before everyone's eyes. And in many ways, start, was the first time I began to recognize the full fruits of a scientific view devoid it from a religious view. And so when I came across uh, Lawrence's Teaching, I felt like this was finally the answer to reconciliation because unfortunately I was trained and was a professional scientist. So that's our introduction. Hillary Johnson is our principal interviewer today. Um, so we want to just kind of have a conversation a little bit about your view of this so-called warfare of science and religion. Right. So Hillary, you have any questions for Dr. Principal? <laughs> well, I've heard tell that it that a lot of this risk supposedly started with Galileo. Mm -hmm. So why Galileo? Why is he important? Well, um, the thing one has to understand about Galileo and the, the texts that Lars, no, let me rephrase that. Galileo is now a folk hero more than he is a historical character when we talk about science and religion. In fact, if we look at the way Galileo was portrayed, by the people who want to promote the idea of a warfare between science and religion. It's actually a, a, that Galileo has very little to do with the historical Galileo. People don't tell you, for example, that Galileo actually took holy orders. He was actually tonsured by the, um, by the um, Archbishop of Florence. Uh, so he took minor holy orders. He was a, a, a believing Catholic to the end of his days. Um, moreover, what he's used as is sort of an icon of a supposed uh, warfare between science and religion, regardless of what any of us who are historians try to tell people. And I've often had the experience of 
I go through the, the history of Galileo, which I'll try and do very briefly, because it's a very long story. It's like an Italian soap opera. Um, <laughs> just too many characters. I could actually put forth on this for, well, you wouldn't get lunch. Um, or dinner, probably. So I'll try and do it briefly. Um, I've often had the experience of trying to explain the history, and people say, no, that can't be right. But, you know, documentary sources are there. The documentary sources are very good, mostly because anything that has to do with the Inquisition, the sources are excellent, very, very excellent. Remember, the church has a, the Catholic Church of the uh, 17th century is a remarkable bureaucratic, very efficient structure. It keeps records really, really, really well. So, what happens with Galileo? Just, you know, shall I just give a quick, okay. Tell you about Galileo. Okay, so what you have to understand is that Galileo's problems, you want to call it a, that, the historian generally call it the Galileo affair, happens in two acts. One is early in the 16 teens, one is late in the early 1630s. First thing that happens is um, the first time that anyone thinks that there's a problem with Galileo is his uh, employer's mother calls one of his students to breakfast with her. This is the Dowager Duchess Christina of the Medici in Florence in 1610. And she says to one of Galileo's students, who is a Benedictine monk, by the way, Benedetto Castelli, who was not only Galileo's student, but he continued to work in the sciences thereafter. Um, she said, this whole thing of the earth revolving around the sun, doesn't that seem to contradict the biblical account of, jo of, of, of Joshua making the sun rather than the earth stand still? And Benedetto Castelli, being a good theologian and a Benedictine, explains, well, it's all the interpretation. We can interpret things in such and such a way. And Galileo writes this long letter to Christina, which is a marvelous piece of, of, of writing, um, very highly theologically informed uh, about how we can, how the two, the text of scripture and the text of the world that he's looking at are harmonious. He's drawing on St. Augustine. There's nothing, there's nothing at all that's revolutionary in this. Okay, so Christina seems to be. Um, but then something happens that we don't understand the background to. There is a bunch of friars, of Dominican friars, at Santa Maria Novella in Florence, who just get a bee in their bonnet against Galileo. And one of them preaches a sermon against him based on making a wonderful pun, Oh, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heavens? With a pun on Galilee and Galileo. And he gives a whole sermon against um, these followers of Galileo. What happens? Well, um, Galileo's students are in the, in the, in the uh, church. Uh, they tell Galileo, one of them goes to the, to the priest uh, there, because the friar who had given the, lect the, the homily was a sort of fill-in, he was substituted. Anywhere. And the priest says, oh, sorry about that. He forces the friar to make an apology to Galileo. <laughs> But what the friar also does is he goes and he sends uh, what's called denunciation of Galileo to the Inquisition, saying that Galileo is holding heretical ideas. Long story short, the, the, the Inquisition looks into this. Galileo, they say, well, there's this letter to Christina that they get a copy of. No one knows where they get the copy of. But the copy has been doctored to make it look worse than it is. Galileo's students go, they say, you got the wrong copy, they give them the real copy, and the Inquisition says, this is fine, there's no problem with it. But then a funny thing happens, again, that we don't know the reason for. Um, someone says, well, let's look in this book of Copernicus. Copernicus with the idea that the sun is at the center of the uh, earth and it revolves around it. Um, it had been written, by this point, 70 years earlier. It had been paid for by cardinals, it had been dedicated to the Pope. Uh, no one had ever made any claim against it that there was any problem from a religious perspective. So the Inquisition does what it does. It forms a committee, right? It's an administrative body. It forms a committee of Dominicans who look at the book. The committee says, comes back with a surprising judgment that it's absurd in philosophy and heretical in sacred scripture. And they suggest to the Inquisition that the book should be um, condemned. The Inquisition never does anything. They issue a statement saying that the book is suspended until corrected. 
which means you can't republish it until certain texts are changed. Of course, if this had been really important, they would have told you what texts these were. But it took another six years to come out with the texts. And basically, it's all places where Copernicus gives an unorthodox meaning of scripture. Nothing about the scientific stuff whatsoever. How does Galileo play into this? Well, as a courtesy to Galileo, um, the commission has one of the chief cardinals, now a Jesuit, um, Ricardo Bellarmi uh, Bellarmino, Roberto, sorry, Roberto Bellarmino, meet privately with Galileo and say, look, this is going to come out, the, the Copernicus is going to be suspended until corrected. For you, um, I've read what you have to say. There's no problem with it. However, what there was a problem with, you reinterpreted scripture in order to fit your own scientific ideas. That's not your job. When you come and prove to me without a shadow of a doubt that the earth is in motion around the sun, then the theologians will go and reinterpret scripture because that's their job. But your job is not to be a theologian. And Galileo, he's an arrogant kind of SOB. Um, and he says in the letter to Christina that, well, you know, we, we natural philosophers, we can interpret scripture, but the theologians can't do science. So it's like, you stay off my turf, but I'm going to walk on yours. So Galileo gets what's called a special injunction in 1616, not to teach the Copernican hypothesis as fact. He can talk about it hypothetically, but not to teach it as fact. Okay, now you have to fast forward. Eight years later, one of his old-time friends is elected Pope. <coughs> this Pope has written poetry in praise of Galileo. I should also mention that while this is going on, the Jesuits are giving Galileo celebratory feasts <coughs> to celebrate his scientific achievements. So when we talk about Galileo and the church, there is no such thing as the church. Right? You have to talk about the people within it, that these people were with Galileo, these people were against. So both on the ecclesiastical and the laity side, Galileo had supporters and detractors on both sides. All right. So his old time friend, fellow Florentine, becomes Pope, goes to Rome, says, hey, Maffeo, I, I've been writing, trying to write this book on the uh, motion of the earth. And the Pope says, you know, that stupid thing with, uh, with putting Copernicus on the index, it should never have happened in the first place. Go ahead and write the book. But I have only one condition for you. You have to realize that when we see something in the natural world, there can be a potentially infinite number of causes behind it. So Galileo was certain that the tides were proof that the earth was in motion. And the Pope said, well, you know, that's possible, but you haven't proven it beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's possible that God could have so contrived the world that a single phenomenon may have many causes, and human frailty means that we can't actually get at the causes with absolute certainty. Just put that in the book somewhere and go ahead and write. Galileo goes away, he writes, he writes for eight years, he sees Yet finishes the book, which he calls Dialogue on the Tides. He sends it through the ecclesiastical censors, who, you know, we have this crazy idea of ecclesiastical censors. It's not some guy who knows nothing about astronomy that's reading Galileo's book. They send it off to the professors of mathematics. It's just like today. I can't publish a book unless I self-publish. If I'm going to publish with a good press, it's going to go out to reviewers who are going to come back with states. Same thing happened to Galileo. He got the so-called imprimatur, let it be printed. The only thing that happened, and this apparently came from the Pope himself, the Pope said, well, don't call it dialogue of the tides, because, you know, that's not really certain. In fact, the Pope was right. The funniest part about all of this is that Galileo got some of the theology right, and the Pope got more of the science right. <laughs> um, and he says, just call it dialogue of the two world systems. Okay, so the, that, was, that was probably a really good thing because we always remember that Galileo's error was in the titles. So the Pope actually did him a favor there. It gets published, <coughs> a copy goes to the Pope, the Pope reads it, he's delighted with it until he gets to the end. And then he becomes furious. Because Galileo, what the heck was in his head? He writes it as a dialogue between three people, person for the Copernican system, 
a person who's to be convinced, and a person for the Aristotelian system, whom he names Simplicio. <laughs> <laughs> now, where does he put the Pope's argument? On the last page, in the mouth of the person who's been to, made to play the fool from page one. And then, the, the, the last word is, oh, what an angelic doctrine. Isn't that great? A totally sarcastic, ironic dismissal of the idea about causation. Pope is furious. So he orders Galileo to come and answer questions. Again, a very long thing happens. Galileo comes and he's supposed to. Um, he goes before the Inquisition. Uh, he says, I don't know what everybody's upset about. I made it hypothetical. You know, maybe I was over eager to make a weaker cause look stronger. And the Inquisition says, oh, okay, just say that, and we'll dismiss everything. So essentially they work out a plea bargain for him. Galileo will say he accidentally was too strong and too unbalanced in his portrayal, and everyone would go home. So this is just like in modern law where you make out a plea bargain, and generally, 99.9% of your time, the judge accepts it. This time the Pope, only time, says no. Galileo has to be officially accused, convicted, and sentenced. Um, he was really <laughs> annoyed at this point. He was also in very dire straits. He, there were attempts to overthrow him. Um, so uh, what we see, at, what, what, what happened is, in very short order, um, Galileo is convicted of sus vehement suspicion of heresy. He has to recant. Um, but the interesting thing is that this recantation should have been signed by all the witnesses who were there. The most powerful of them was the Pope's own nephew, who refused to sign the document. So really what the whole thing was was a show trial to show that the Pope wasn't weak. And and just, just to nail back, just the Pope, reason the Pope was under pressure is he had some things going on the Spanish pushing in. Exactly. The, the, the Pope had been under pressure by the Spaniards to declare the Thirty Years' War a holy war against the Protestants, which he refused to do. Um, and uh, the Spanish were trying to overthrow him. Also, there was, there was tell that um, Galileo was really close with a bunch of astrologers who had predicted the Pope's death. <laughs> that was not a really good thing. And when he, goes to, when he goes to Rome to answer these questions, the first person he meets is this astrologer. This, and he, Galileo he might have been a brilliant scientist, but he was really bad with human interaction. Just really, really bad. And that's really what got him into trouble. Um, so what we're seeing is, is, is this sort of perfect storm of political, um, dynastic, uh, uh, social pressures that come to bear. And Galileo is the pressure point because he does a really dumb thing in the dark. Um, if you want to see what happens afterwards, I'm taking up, this is this story got much longer than I wanted it to be, I'm afraid. But um, who are the f first people that start teaching Galileo's new science? It's the Jesuits in Italian universities. So if there were really some kind of opposition, some kind of ecclesiastical opposition to Galileo, that wouldn't have been where it happened. So we, we draw out of here, this is really when I started with a story like this. Look at the historical nuances going on here and all the things that get distilled down to a simple caricature today. Right. So let's back up now. There's a warfare of science and religion, yeah. which you've been studying for a long time. Uh, it's kind of been cooked up. So maybe we back up now and talk about definitions. Yeah, let's do that. Because we're talking about two terms, but we often fail to stop and say, so what do we really mean and what are they really? Can we just talk about that? Yeah, now? science and religion are two terms that you don't want to really have to try to define because they change. They have historical context. They're, uh, what counts as one or the other in the 17th century doesn't count in the 21st. So their borders are constantly under renegotiation of what they actually mean. Um, for, for science, I mean, it, it, people are really surprised to find out that scientist as a term is a neologism that as late as 1926 the journal Nature refused to use because they thought it was a vulgar Americanism. In fact, it was coined as a joke uh, by William Hewell at a meeting of the British Academy of, for the Advancement of Science in 1838. They, these 
there are these people who were ordinarily known as natural philosophers, uh, were sitting around thinking, what are we going to call ourselves? And he said, oh, 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 well, people who do art are called artists. How about people who do science will call ourselves scientists? And everybody laughed. <laughs> but it caught on, <laughs> even though it was made as a joke. This is why historical context is so crucial. It gives you a better insight into what's actually going on. So, um, the definition for science is really very closely tied up with the professional identity of the scientist. And that professional identity of the scientist just sort of begins to form in the 17th and 18th century. It doesn't really become anything that we would recognize today until the end of the 19th century. Now, what's really interesting is, well, you go ahead. I just want to, you know, I should stop and say, what is science and what is religion? Definition. <laughs> in, at what time period, in what social context? <laughs> what do you think we should say? Well, we say that, we, we flip those terms off all the time, and we say science has proved this about religion, vice versa. What are we talking about there? With those You're just people? making it more complex. You're making it more complex if you use the word prove. Uh, well, we'll leave that out for now and just take the two endpoints science and religion. Okay, well, what I'll give you is the caricature, right? Okay. The caricature is that science is about absolute knowledge that's determined from observation of the natural world. And anybody who's taken philosophy 101 knows that that's nuts. Okay? Um, our observations of the natural world do not exactly immediately transform into absolute knowledge about the hidden workings of things. At least from the scientific perspective, religion is reduced, honestly, either to a system of ethics a system of morality, or a system of mythology, where there are, or a system of creeds, where there are unsupported beliefs. Now, I'm giving you, obviously, the end. Again, anyone who knows anything about religion has taken Theology 101, which unfortunately is not as popular a class as Philosophy 101, um, knows that that's a ridiculous caricature as well. What we really want to get at is how did those two definitions come to us be? Right? So the same time that the, prof the, the, the image of the professional scientist is being hammered out, this is the late 19th century, <coughs> in the United States, in England, on the continent as well in particular. That's exactly the same time that the myth of the warfare of science and religion is <coughs> devised. Which is what you've just been working on. Which is what I've just been working on. It's a very interesting story that... Um, there are two people, um, Andrew Dixon White, who's the founder of Cornell University, and uh, John William Draper, who's the first president of the American Chemical Society, professor of chemistry, shamefully enough, um, and of physiology at NYU. Uh, they both come out within a couple of years of each other with what has become the standard description of the historical background between Christianity and science. Date and date was. So, 1869, when White first starts speaking, and 1876, which is uh, uh, Draper's book. So, a very short time period in there. Um, there's a, those books, maybe you've never heard of these books. One is called The Warfare of Science and Religion, one is called The Conflict Between Religion and Science. Right? Very original. Um, <laughs> The problem is, is that they are they try to tell history, but virtually every historical detail in there is either twisted, taken out of context, or entirely fabricated. Example: Columbus. Columbus. Okay. Here's this. This, this is the poem I do for all my classes. How many of you were taught at some point in the past that Columbus or Magellan or one of those people in the 16th century, 15th, 16th century? Prove that the Earth was round. And before that, everybody thought it was flat. Okay. Uh, okay. Your second question: How many of you were taught that Columbus was opposed by the Church when he proposed to sail west and find the, the East uh, because the Church believed the world was flat? Yeah. All right. Okay. It's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie that was 
It was, it's in Draper, it's in White. You know where they got it from? They got it from The Life of Columbus, which was written by Washington Irving, yeah. the novelist of, you know, Headless Horseman fame. It's a totally romanticized story, and they took it as literal history. Now, if you actually look at the records of the Council of Salamanca in Spain, where Columbus went to, to speak, yeah, sure, there were theologians and churchmen there who said, look, buddy, you got the diameter, of the, you got the circumference of the Earth way off. <coughs> off by what we now know to be the width of the Pacific Ocean. And they, were right. <laughs> and they were right, because they knew the science. What did Copernicus oppose them with? Lines out of the Old Testament that he was reinterpreting to talk about the, the, the way, the size of the Earth. They were like, what, are you kidding me? You can't use that for a scientific... Uh, uh, explanation. So it's completely opposite. We've been told this, these, we've been told these tall tales of, again, that uh, the Catholic Church forbade human dissection. This is nonsense. Every Italian medical school by the Middle Ages required human dissection. The only problem with human dissection was that you couldn't get enough bodies because nobody wanted their relatives chopped up on a table in front of spectators. Um, so what Draper and White did was to confect this artificial history. And to do so, they did two things. One, um, well, they told a lot of falsehoods. But uh, the, the one thing that they did in particular was they co-opted, and it's only now I'm beginning to see this, they co-opted the story of early Christianity, of early Christians against the pagan Roman authorities to cast themselves, the new scientist who's just hammering out his own social position at this point, as the new priesthood against an establishment of religion. And so what do they do? They create a, 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 a litany of saints, of martyrs, of prophets throughout history who somehow opposed religion and were either killed or silenced. And I have another question for you. How many of you have seen the retread of the Cosmos series? Carl Sagan? Yeah, Carl Sagan's the, the old original. one. There's a retread now, mm -hmm. a new one that just came out. Have you seen it? Yeah. You saw the first one? Mm -hmm. Did you manage to live through it, or did you just? It, it, it was hard to sit through. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. So those of you who haven't seen it, congratulations, you made the right choice. <laughs> All of their history is taken from where? Is it taken from the people who wear, we wear our fingers to the bone, like me, in archives, <laughs> trying to find out the truth about history? No. Did they ask any of us? No. They went to Draper and White. A 150-year-old, crappy, bad history. So they tell a story about Bruno, okay, one of the great, supposedly great martyrs of, of science. <laughs> and they make a cartoon sequence of him being persecuted by the church. Um, it, it's really, it's extraordinary. It is, first of all, as an Italian and a Catholic, it was so racist because they actually made all the Catholic prelates darker colored than Bruno. <laughs> Wait a minute, what country am I living in and what year is it? I can't believe that they got away with this. This is unbelievable. The funny part is, you know, know where you get your drop art from. So one of the key points is Bruno has um, Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, an ancient Roman poem on the plurality of worlds and atomism, hidden under the floorboards, right, in his, uh, in his monastic cell. First of all, they don't even realize what a Dominican prior is, which he was. He wasn't a Benedictine. Um, and he's reading it, and all of a sudden, a bishop with a miter and a crozier, like they walk around with them, um, <laughs> bursts in, and he gets arrested and put on trial. Okay. Well, they have this picture of the bishop breaking in over his shoulder, and you can see this beautifully illuminated copy of De Rerum Natura in his hands. And, you know, I looked at that, and I said, I've seen that somewhere before. Where have I seen that particular manuscript? <clears throat> oh, I did a little search. Yeah. So this book that Bruno supposedly gets burned at the stake for reading and is, you know, arrested by a bishop, 
The copy that the animator used is actually the presentation copy of the work that was given to Pope Sixtus IV. <laughs> and it's in the Vatican Library. This is how dumb <laughs> people are. I, you know, but at some point, you know, I can talk all I want about this. This is why I started talking about folklore at the first point. These, the, the mythology that Draper and White came up with has become a naturalized fact in society. It's something that we all pick up without even being aware of it. I did. We all have at some point or another because it's part of our culture now. The only cure for that, of course, is to you know, get the history right, which is actually harder. That's actually much more difficult. Um, so why is this important today? What does, it, what does this mean to me if I'm trying to sort out what I want to do in my life? And, you know. I think it's important today because if you look at science and technology, we can't move a centimeter without running into it. It produces the clothes that we wear, it gives us food, it gives us light, heat, everything. So science is an absolute, science and technology both are crucial parts of human civilization today. But so is religion. But so is religion. And the the, the, fool, war. the well, the foolish part of it is that they're trying to. It's as if they're trying to occupy the same evolutionary ecological niche, which they don't have to. Now, I do not approve of the idea. There's a there's a theory on the on the uh, on the um, relationship between science and religion called noma, non-overlapping agisteria, which Stephen Jay Gould came up with, which I don't agree with, because. It is, it, there are two problems with it. He, what he says is that science and religion are just separate, so they don't step on each other's turf, which I don't think is true um, for two reasons. One, it's clearly a formulation that comes post-warfare. In other words, it's a way to fix warfare rather than saying that the warfare is just not right in the first place. Second, it's, a, it's entirely um, a sort of liberal Protestant view, which is too narrow for um, talking about religion in general. Religion does make certain claims about the natural world, right? That the world had a beginning, that it is creatio ex nihilo, that it is created out of nothing. There, it doesn't make a lot of claims about the natural world, but it makes some. And I, I am not satisfied personally with a religion that restricts itself to saying things about morals or ethics. That's not enough. Because those morals and ethics have to be grounded in something. Right? Um, it also makes the assumption that religion, this is a, this is a big problem. This is, a, this is the creeping problem with the science religion thing. There is often a tacit assumption that religion is somehow weak. And it has to be protected against the methodologies of science. Does the science prove that religion is false, that there's no God? No, it can't. In fact, by the definition of science, it cannot even speak about those issues. Why not? Because science is supposed to eschew metaphysical statements. That is, statements that are outside the realm of observation and experiment. So there are some people, there are some uh, philosophers of science that would say that we should not even have universalizing theories because theories themselves are metaphysical statements. You can't see a theory, right? You can't see the theory of gravity. As an example. You can just make inductive arguments about it. Okay, that's an example. But the idea that religion is weak and has to be protected is, is I think, it's, it's the, um, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor which is not coming to mind. But it's, it's, it's the sort of sneaky way that the uh, myth of the warfare of science and religion gets root, that somehow science has these somehow superior epistemological tools that can be applied to everything. And what not scientists, but what I'll call science, scientismists, that is the people, by scientism what I mean is the idea that scientific principles, again, defined in a very narrow, very modern, very socially constructed way, um, 
are sufficient to answer all questions whatsoever, and whatever they don't answer, well, it's not worth asking that question. Um, what the scientismists will claim is that, well, yeah, if you have a question, science has to answer it. If science can't answer it, then it's not a question. They, this, they get this out of a failed, we're talking about success and failure, a failed um, philosophical movement of the 1920s called logical positivism that said that everything has to be an observational term. If it's not observable, then it's metaphysical. And so metaphysical statements for them have, as one of their exponents said, any kind of statement that's not observable makes as much sense as saying Caesar is a prime number. In other words, it literally has no meaning. It literally has zero meaning. <coughs> now, of course, the obvious, well, it took 40 years, but the, the argument against this is that observation, we don't just make observations as some disembodied, non-experienced entity. Every one of our observations is mediated by past experiences. And every observation is mediated by interpretation. So when you really get down to it, now I'm getting back to your question about science and religion and their definitions, all of our experiences are mediated by past experiences. We, what we have to do is stop being so obsessed by this idea that comes to us from scientism that we have to have absolute doubt-free certainty about things. That's the problem. That is the problem. Well, and so you mentioned just briefly that one of our assumptions is that we only have scientific tools in our epistemological tools. Can you speak more to what are these tools and to Greg's point about what is important? And as we leave this room, what tools should we be developing to think well about these two extremes that aren't really extremes? Right. Um, the problem with the scientific tool set is not that it's a bad tool set, but that it's, it, it, it's, it's overrated in a sense. And that, that, by that, I, I'm a scientist myself. I, I mean, no disrespect, I'm not criticizing science. It's very successful at what it does when it does what it's supposed to be doing. But 